All right, guys, so this behind me is the Bellagio Poker Room on a Friday night during the World Series of Poker. And for those of you guys who haven't been here during this time, it's absolute madness. Every single game has a list that's thousands of players long, it seems. There's multiple tables of every stake, and trying to get in a game is just as difficult as you might predict. Now, I'm on the list for 1020 No Limit Hold'em. There's three tables of it and around 30 people on the list. I'm gonna wait around until I get into one of those games. I'm gonna share all the hands with you guys. So without any further ado, let's fast forward however long it takes. Just a few seconds for you guys. Get in there and gamble. All right, guys, here we are at the Bellagio playing 1020. There are three must move tables today for this game. So that means I'm gonna be moving around between a few different tables. Not something I'm used to, but here we go. I sit with around $30,000. And in the first interesting hand, I open up the action to 60 with Jack nine of hearts. Only the big blind calls. So we go heads up to a flop of ace, king, 10, two clubs and one spade. Not a whole lot for me, just a straight draw, but it is a board that's generally gonna favor me. So when the big blind checks, I continue with a bet of $140. And my opponent makes the call. Turn card is the seven of spades and he checks once more. He's got around $800 behind. Now we have a question between checking back, essentially giving up or continuing to apply pressure. And I think checking back is okay, but we don't have any clubs or spades, so if he's got a flush draw, we could likely get him to fold those hands. And if he's just got a weak ace, it's gonna be really hard for him to call for his entire stack, I think. So I announce all in for 800, just like I would with any strong holdings. My opponent thinks about it for quite some time and ends up calling. So that's not good news. We're in some trouble right off the bat. Looking for a queen on the river, which does not come. It's the three of hearts and we end up losing versus ace eight off suit. A little bit spewy perhaps to start off the night, but this was one of the few players at the table who looks like he's here for a good time. And against players like that, I'm always happy to give some action. In the second hand, we will be battling this same nemesis. He opens the button to 60 and I look down at ace jack of spades in the smallest of blinds. I raise it up to 260 and he makes the call with around 2000 left in his stack. Heads up to a flop of 10, eight, seven, two diamonds, one spade. So I've got a straight draw and a backdoor flush draw. Not much else aside from that. And this is a board that's probably better for him. So I check it and he bets $160. Like I said, we have some backdoor possibilities and also two overcards to the 10. So I make the call and we see an interesting turn card. It's the queen of clubs giving me what's called a double gutter. That means any king or nine will now improve me to a straight. I check it again and this time he checks it back. We get a lot of help on the river. It's the king of diamonds giving me the best possible straight on the board. At this point, we are only losing to a flush, which is possible, of course, but after he checks back on the turn, I don't think he's got one, since he'd probably continue trying to bluff with any sort of diamond draw on the turn. So I put in a bet of $380, trying to get called by two pair, perhaps even a worse straight, although it doesn't seem too likely. At this point, my opponent gives me some bad news and announces all in for $1,800 or so, and now we're in a tough spot because like I said, we have the best possible straight, but would he really be jamming all in with anything worse than a flush? I don't know, I think it's questionable, but like I said a few seconds ago, I expected him to continue bluffing with any sort of diamond draw on the turn, unless of course he picked up a pair, for example, queen X of diamonds, which is certainly possible. Maybe even a hand like seven X of diamonds that bets the flop and then checks back on the turn for some pot control. I don't know, it's a tough spot. I can't really think of too many bluffs, but I also can't think of too many possible flushes. Eh, I don't know, it's kind of close. And as you guys probably know by now, when a decision is close, I tend to put chips in the pot. So that's what I do. And perhaps a bit surprisingly, my opponent says good call and shows ace 10 with the ace of diamonds, a pretty sweet bluff on his end. Unfortunately, he ran into an idiot that's not very good at folding, so we end up winning this pot. Next, we move to the final hand at this first table. 
And guess who we're playing against? <laughs> That's right, this same guy. He opens to $60, and I make it 200 in late position with seven five of diamonds. Should probably fold this hand against someone who's playing really tight, but this guy's playing a bunch of hands, and I'm trying to give him some action, especially after that big pot he just lost against me. So 200 in there with a seven high. The big blind cold calls my $200 re-raise, now gets back to the initial raiser, and he announces all in for his fresh rebuy that just hit the table and it's all in the middle. And of course, I've got seven high. This is a non-decision, easy fold, right? Yeah, maybe, you know, if he's got an over pair, we're in terrible shape. But if he's got a hand like ace king or really any two over cards, we're really not in that bad of shape. And there's also 200 extra dollars from the big blind, which I presume to be dead money since if he had a really strong hand, he'd probably raise my original $200 bet. So I decide to get in there and gamble, hoping I have two live cards. I toss in the thousand. The big blind folds, thankfully, so we are heads up off to a run out. I ask him if he's got a pair and he says, no, I don't. So that's exactly what we were hoping for. We go to a flop of 973 with two diamonds, giving me a pair and a flush draw. Turn card's not great though, it's the ace of spades, but the river is the five of spades. So we make two pair, somehow we still lose though. My opponent's got ace nine of clubs, so quite the action run out. And this is what I wanted to have happen pre-flop is we get into an exciting race. Win or lose, it's still a fun hand either way. As mentioned, this was my last hand at this table before getting moved to table number two, where we receive some good news that the entire table is straddling. So. From here on out, on the rest of the night, we're gonna be playing 10, 20, 40. In the first hand here, there's a late position open to 100, and I look down at pocket threes in this small blind. Think it's okay to call, think it's okay to fold, think it's probably not okay to do what I did and raise it up. I make it $500 to go. As mentioned, it is a Friday night here at Bellagio during the World Series of Poker, and I came all the way from California. I'm gonna gamble. I make it 500 with pocket threes. Folds back to the initial raiser in late position, and he instantly punishes my light re-raise by making it some more money. But it's only 1150, I believe is the exact amount, so essentially a min-raise. Now, let me be the first to say, with pocket threes, when you're facing all this aggression, especially from a tight player who hasn't played a hand in a while, you should probably just let it go. But at the same time, if this guy hasn't played too many hands, then he's likely got a big holding. And if we're able to flop a set versus said big holding, we could probably win a big pot and you know, it'll be good for the vlog. So I toss in the money and we get instantly rewarded for the questionable pre-flop decision-making. Ace five, three on the flop, bottom set and an ace out there. Of course, there is a slight concern that we're up against pocket aces, but at bare minimum, that'll provide a good title for this vlog. I check it over to him and he continues with a very tiny bet of $420. Don't think I should have any re-raises in this situation, so I just call and we see the six of clubs on the turn. I check it again and this time my opponent checks it back. River card is the four of spades. Now any seven or two make a straight, but I don't think either of us would really ever have a hand that contains a seven or a two. However, if there were one of us that would have one of those cards, it's probably me. And I've got a set, so I'm gonna jam all in for his remaining $3,300. Three of the same card, going for some value, it's not rocket science. My opponent doesn't seem too pleased with the situation, but after a few seconds of thought, he decides to call. I turn it over, and he mucks. So that's good news, he probably had ace-king, if I had to guess, and we end up winning this nearly $10,000 pot. A very warm welcome to table number two. And the next one, there's a button open to 100, Small blind and big blind make the call before I look down at ace king in the straddle. Good enough to raise, of course, so I make it $600. Now it gets back to the button, and this guy is actually the same nemesis from table number one who has also moved over to this table now. He announces all in for $1,100. The blinds fold, I of course make the call, and we end up winning versus king queen of clubs on an ace king high board. Not the most exciting hand in the world, but somewhat noteworthy. You know, there's two all-ins before the flop. It's kind of cool. We end up winning. That's also kind of cool. In the next hand, there's an early position open to 100. Someone makes the call, and I look down at king-queen on the button. Now, I was busy getting the camera and everything situated, so I didn't notice that someone called. I decide to re-raise. I make it $320. It's at this point I notice 
that someone called the initial 100, so my raise is pretty small when you take that into consideration. But looks like it doesn't end up making any difference because the initial raiser folds, but the guy who called the $100 open, he makes the call again. So pretty much a perfect situation. Going to a flop of 10-6-4 with two hearts. So we've got some backdoor flush draw, backdoor straight draw, overcard type stuff going on. He checks, I continue with a small bet of 260, and he makes the call. Turn card is good, it's the ace of hearts. Should be much better for me than for him, and it also improves me to a flush draw and a straight draw now. So when he checks, I'm going to continue applying pressure, much like I would with top pair, two pair, a flush, etc. You guys get the idea. I throw in one yellow chip worth a thousand dollars. My opponent thinks it over for quite some time. It would kind of suck to face a check raise all in at this point and probably have to fold, but that doesn't happen. Instead, he releases his cards and we get this bluff through. In the next one, I raise it up with King Jack unsuited to 120 and get called by the button and straddler. Three of us go to a flop of seven three deuce, two clubs, one diamond. Straddler checks, I decide to check as well, as does the button. So three of us still go into a turn, which is the king of spades. We now make top pair on what looked like a hopeless board. Small blind now leads out for $120. Don't see much point in raising, so I make the call and the button folds. River is not great. It's the four of clubs, which brings in the most obvious flush draw, as well as some potential straight draws, I suppose, like 6-5 or ace-5 suited. And now my opponent leads out for $550. This is a tough spot, or at least it is in my opinion, because even though we've got top pair, I think my opponent knows that I've got a king and he's deciding to bet anyways. It doesn't really seem like a spot that people bluff too often. And if he had a hand like eight, seven suited or any sort of single pair type holding, I suspect he would check in hopes of trying to get to showdown. So this bet essentially represents either something much better than a king or a total bluff. And I just don't see too many bluffs now that a lot of draws arrive on the river. So, I don't know, I think about it for some time and decide to stay disciplined this hand. I let this one go. Now we move over to the third table of the night. And this table was by far the one where I played the most action pots. Starting off with this first one where I get ace 10 of diamonds in early position, I open it up to 120, and then a player in middle position makes it $400. Action gets back around to me, and with a suited ace out of position, I think it's a good candidate to put in another raise. We have removal to strong hands and could take advantage of the fact that we open from early position, right? We should get some credit with this raise. So I make it $1,100 to go. We don't get much credit because my opponent doesn't think too long before calling. So going off to a flop, but that's quite all right. We've got a playable hand and even more so when it comes eight, four deuce with two diamonds. That means we've got two over cards and more importantly, the nut flush draw. Always nice to flop that. Even better if we can actually hit it, right? I bet $700, much like I would with aces, kings, queens, you know, the good stuff. My opponent makes the call and we see some help on the turn. It's the 10 of spades, giving me a pretty disguised top pair, top kicker. But I think we've reached the point in the hand where I would be checking a lot of my holdings sometimes, especially being out of position. So it's nice to have some disguised strength when I do that. And my hand definitely qualifies in that category now that I've got top pair. So I check it, my opponent checks it back. River is quite interesting. It's the ace of spades, giving me top two pair now. So we do get there, but not exactly the way I was hoping to. You know, diamond would have been cooler. Now it's a question of do we want to check again or bet for value? And I don't know. If I'm being completely honest, I think this spot is a little bit complex. In the end, I decided to bet out for value, thinking to myself I could have some bluffs. I put in $2,400. Not entirely sure if this is the best play, but after he checks back on the turn, I think he could have some ace highs like ace king that calls preflop maybe ace-queen suited, uh, and maybe even hands like pocket jacks or so that get a little bit curious once I bet this river. So I put in 2,400, like I said. My opponent thinks it over for quite some time, but eventually makes the right decision and lets it go. Still always nice to win a $3,700 pot with ace-10. In the next one, I look down at 6-3 of diamonds on the button. I open it up to 120 and get called by the big blind and straddler. So three of us go to a flop, which comes jack-8-deuce with one diamond. 
action checks to me, and there are a lot of good turn cards for my hand. Plus, this isn't a board that I expect anyone to be too strong on, so I continue with a bet of $140. Not necessarily expecting it to work right away, but good things can happen on the turn and river. The big blind calls, but the straddler folds. I'm bearing in mind that the big blind called with the straddler left to act, so I think it's most likely he's got at least a jack, maybe an eight, but probably not calling with an eight as there's a player left to act behind him. So when the turn comes the deuce of spades and he checks, I think this is a cool spot to apply a lot of pressure by betting really big. However, in the moment I decided to check it back, thinking to myself that if I'm betting my exact hand, I probably have too many bluffs in a situation like this, which if I'm being honest, it's probably not that bad of a concept when you're playing Bellagio 1020. A lot of these guys are playing relatively tight, so could probably get away with it. This time, I just check it back though, and we see the queen of spades on the river. He checks again, and now I decide to bet as a bluff. Of course, I've got six high, and I'm targeting a jack or perhaps an eight, thinking both of those holdings will fold. I put in $340, and I'm a bit surprised when we get called and my opponent shows queen nine of diamonds. So yeah, we lose this one. I certainly didn't play at my best, but yeah, I didn't think he would have a queen after the way he played the flop. Live and learn, I guess. Moving right along, exactly one orbit later, I am on the button. And if you thought 6-3 of diamonds was a bad hand, check this out. I've got 9 deuce of diamonds. Well, actually, I guess 9 high is better than 6 high, but somehow this one feels worse. I raise it up to 120, and only the straddler calls. Flop comes down not bad. It's 3-3 three, three deuce, 1 diamond. We've got 2 pair, technically, and a flush draw. He checks, I bet 100, and he calls. Turn card is the 3 of clubs. So yeah, all you guys who were judging me for playing 9 deuce, I've got a full house. He checks, I bet $400 now, and this is where the hand gets kind of weird as my opponent check raises to $1,000. Of course, it's already not a great spot for me. Sure, I've got a boat, but it's a fake boat, and we could be up against bigger pocket pairs, or of course, four of a kind. But at the same time, this opponent in particular seemed like someone who might try to come after me given the chance. He had mentioned a few times that he wanted to play pots against me. So I make the call and we see the queen of diamonds on the river. Pots around 2,500 and that's exactly what my opponent bets. 2,500 sliding a stack of blacks out into the pot. Hmm, like I just said in the last hand, most players here at the Bellagio are playing pretty tight. Don't think he's gonna be bluffing too often if I'm being honest, but also, what strong hands could he have that play this way? If he had a hand like pocket fours through eights, for example, would he really try to go for this big a value bet on the river? Seems a bit optimistic on my end. On the other hand, what's he representing? Four of a kind? I mean, yeah, that is what he's representing, but come on. It's so hard to make four of a kind, isn't it? So yeah, it's tough to assign him many bluffs, also tough to assign him many value bets. And when that's the case, at the Bellagio, you should probably err towards folding but that's not what I do. I toss in a call after some thought. Sure enough, my opponent's got queen three of spades. That's a full house, four of a kind, and he beats me like 13 different ways in this hand. Nice hand, bro. So yeah, things started off not too bad. Now they're going in the opposite direction. Let's see if we can reverse that trend. This next hand, we're playing a $100 bomb pot. That means everyone throws in 100 bucks, and we go to a flop. I look down at seven, five of spades. Not bad for a bomb pot. And the flop comes down 8, 6, 3, 2 hearts and a spade. So we've got an open-ended straight draw and a backdoor flush draw. But I'm in early position, so I decide to check it, and the action checks around. Turn card brings some help. It's the 9 of hearts. However, the small blind now leads out for $360. And considering that he's leading into the whole field when the flush gets there, I decide to just call with my straight, as does a player in late position. River card is the queen of clubs and the small blind does not slow down. He now puts in a bet of $1,360. Now we're in a tough spot. Yeah, we've got a straight, but I don't have any hearts in my hand, which is not great. And someone called in late position after I called the turn. So perhaps we could be up against a flush from that guy or maybe the guy who's betting. They could even have better straights like 10-7 that are betting for value, maybe even jack-10 with a heart, all sorts of stuff that we lose to. So yeah, what looked like a good situation ends up becoming not so great and I decide to let it go. Unfortunately, the player behind me also folds, so we'll never know what the small blind had, but whatever it was, 
he had the winning hand as he rakes this pot in. And that, ladies and gentlemen, brings us to the most interesting hand of the session and also the biggest pot of the session. In this one, I raise it up with Jack eight of diamonds in early position to $120, perhaps questionable. The button calls and now the small blind re-raises to 400. This is a pretty small raise considering that I made it 120 and the button called. So I decide to call in position but looking back, I think it's probably better to re-raise and try to get the button out and play heads up versus a small blind. I should note that the small blind is also the only other player at the table who's got quite a few chips. I think he's got like $40,000 or so. Everyone else kind of shallow. So calling in position with a suited three gapper like this, I'm not a big fan of it, but that's what I did in the moment, as does the button, which of course is the whole downside to me calling is we're now playing between two opponents, hoping to hit something. Not really the way you wanna play poker, but here we go. Three of us go to a flop, which comes 10, nine, five, two clubs. Not too bad, we've got an open-ended straight draw, but that's about it. Small blind bets $600. I decide to call at least once, and then the button calls also. So definitely not in love with the situation until the miracle turn card hits the table. It's the seven of hearts, giving me the stone cold nuts in a very disguised fashion, I might say, because I mean, let's face it, who would have Jack eight suited in this spot? Not too many players, I think. Small blind now decides to slow down and check it. I've got a straight and I don't have any removal to top pair, two pair and of course flush draws, so I'm gonna bet for value. I throw in $2,200. The button thinks for quite some time now, but sadly decides to fold. However, the small blind, who is the initial re-raiser, is not going anywhere just yet. He tosses in the $2,200, and I think at this point it's obvious he's got an over pair, and he's you know exercising a little bit of caution on the turn by checking and just calling a bet. So looking for a clean river card to put in one more value bet. And we kind of get it, it's the nine of hearts, which pairs the board. Now we're obviously losing to a hand like pocket tens or pocket nines, but can't be scared of monsters under the bed. I still think it's most likely he's got an over pair. And the good thing about this card is that all the draws missed. Well, not all of them, but for the most part, you know, flush draws, some potential straight draws like queen jack suited, all of those are left with a whole lot of nothing. So when he checks, I'm gonna try to act like I've got one of those missed draws I throw in a big bet of $9,000. I think this is the magic number. You know, if he's got an overpair, he's probably gonna call it. But perhaps we bet a little too big because my opponent does not call right away. He doesn't seem in love with the situation, but in the end, he does toss in a call. That looks like good news to me. And sure enough, when I turn over the jack high straight, my opponent frustratedly mucks his hand. We end up winning an over $25,000 pot putting us at a nice profitable point for the session and things are suddenly going much better. Anyway, this was the last noteworthy moment of my night. As always, I hope you all enjoyed the hands. So that brings an end to tonight's session. I was into the game for I don't even know how much actually, but I ended up winning just over $16,000, which is not bad considering that it was a 10-20 game. Well, rather a 10-20-40 game. Either way, for a game that size, 16K win. I'm more than happy with it. No complaints whatsoever. Definitely not bad for a Friday night out in Las Vegas. It is pretty late though, around 2 a.m. Andrew Nimi actually just texted me asking to uh, play 1-3 at the win, but I think I'm gonna pass and go to bed. I kind of want to go to the gym in the morning and try to stay on a normal sleeping schedule, so it kind of sucks to uh, say no to the vlog father. Andrew, if you're watching this, you're probably not, but in case you are, rain check on the 1-3. Anyways, I hope you all enjoyed the hands. And this is probably the extent of my WSOP experience. You guys already know I don't really love tournaments and uh, I'm not really planning on coming back for at least a few weeks, if not months. So uh, 
yeah, this channel is definitely not the best channel for WSOP type of stuff. Head over to Rampage or Brad Owen or whoever's playing tournaments these days. It's not this guy. All right, guys, until next time, good luck at your local tables. Peace.